it is recording. How's it going, Drew? How are you doing today? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. This is fun, Austin. Of course. I got to start off with what is your favorite superhero? My favorite superhero is Super Grover uh, from Sesame Street. I don't know if that classifies as a real superhero, but I'm a big Grover fan. So uh, yeah, Super Grover. I like Super Grover because he's, he, he, you know, he ends up helping people, but he doesn't realize it. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's kind of a, a bumbling idiot. And uh, he basically helps people understand that they can help themselves. Awesome. Uh, so uh, Super Grover's top of my list. Awesome. So we'll get to the Muppets. Does, does, well, let me ask you a question. Does anybody ask you who your favorite superhero is? Uh, probably one person. I think one person. Yeah. And what's and your, what do you Captain say? Captain America. Captain oh, America. that's a good one. The yeah. reason being, for some reason, and I don't know if it's just the movies or if it's like everywhere and all the comics, he's like the strongest. He can live through anything. Like people don't realize this, but like he grabs Thor's hammer or he holds Thanos' hand. And he does all these things. And I'm like, it's literally for him though, just because he has passion. It's a definite yeah. purpose. And he's like, I'm fucking doing this. And I'm like, oh, I love it. Yeah. That's great, man. Oh, good. Good one. Hell yeah. Awesome. So we'll, we'll get into uh, the Muppets and everything like that in a minute, but let's start with your story and how you came to be who you are today. <laughs> well, I started my career in television. Um, I went to school for television and film. I went to Boston University. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was excited about being in the television business. This was a, the early 90s. Um, and so, you know, there was kind of this cable television explosion, uh, and I worked for NBC and wrote for Charles Corralt, who's like a great storyteller, uh, who's not around anymore. Um, and then I got the job at the Muppets, which was kind of my dream job. It's what I really wanted to do. Uh, and I, I landed that job actually by writing one letter every month, like a handwritten letter every month to the, uh, yeah. executive in charge of production. Uh, and he finally, he finally granted me an interview after three years. Uh, and uh, I ended up getting the job that day, the, the day uh, we ended up chatting. So that was cool. And then um, the Muppets was a great job, but it, it, I, I actually learned a lot about marketing at the Muppets. And uh, when the dot-com boom came in the late 90s, uh, I left the television world and started working in marketing for a bunch of startups. And uh, after after the kind of startup boom collapsed, <laughs> I, uh, I decided I'd start my own uh, digital marketing agency with a journalist friend of mine, a guy named Jim Costco. And um, so we started a marketing agency. Didn't really know how to run an agency, but built that uh, over the next 12 years uh, to 2012. Sold the agency, wrote a book called Brandscaping. Uh, in 2012 and then started touring the world speaking and so since 2012 I've just been speaking and writing books uh, and my latest book Town Inc came out in 2015 and I'm working on another one right now called The Loyalty Loop that's my awesome. that was the short version awesome so I actually just recently listened to the podcast on The Loyalty Loop or on oh cool or on The Loyalty and I love the mindset but I want to backtrack for a second to storytelling because I know you love storytelling integrating it into marketing into basically yeah. So I wanted to talk about yeah. like how to tell an effective story and make it about whatever you're trying to make it about. Yeah, the key to creating a great story that actually inspires people to buy something, <laughs> uh, I actually learned at the Muppets. I mean, so the truth is, you know, the Jim Henson Company, uh, you know, which has made great films like, you know, uh, like, you know, the great Muppet caper or Muppets in Manhattan or the Muppet movie, uh, you know, they, they're, they're known for Sesame street. I worked on bear in the big blue house and, um, you know, really the Jim Henson company doesn't make much money on the, the, the television and film productions. Um, in fact, they, some of them run at a complete loss, meaning millions of dollars are being lost creating the content. Uh, but where they make their money is licensing, the toys, the games, the stuff, right? And they, they're very acutely aware that if they don't create content that people fall in love with, that they actually really love, um, and the characters aren't lovable and likable, that, that they'll never be able to license that stuff. So they have to have great content that inspires people to buy something they didn't, like, I mean, I like Super Grover, right? And yeah. you're not gonna buy a Super Grover, you know, plush doll if, if, if you don't fall in love with Super Grover, there's no need for it. Yeah. So, I, you know, the Jim Henson Company really understands that great storytelling can inspire people to buy things. And if you're gonna create, you know, great stories that inspire people to buy things, the first thing you have to understand is what is their moment of inspiration? A moment of inspiration is an instant in time that sends a, a potential customer on a journey they never expected. So if you're watching 
fixer upper on the weekend and you know they they make a they put up some you know shiplap on your bathroom wall and you're like man i want to put shiplap up on the bathroom wall that's a moment of inspiration because now you're on a journey to figure out how to put shiplap up on your bathroom wall you that's the kind of content you want to create and and fixer upper is actually a great example i mean the I don't know if you've never seen it it's a, no. it's a do it yourself uh, you know makeover show on hgtv uh, and it's with two, two people, Chip and Joanne, uh, and they've created a, a they're, they're based in Waco, Texas, and they've created a massive empire of uh, everything from publishing to products. Uh, they have a magazine called Magnolia, which is one of the top selling magazines on the newsstand today. Um, and it all started because people fell in love with their show, the content, uh, and now want to buy the stuff that they talk about on the show. Wow. So that is fantastic. So would you typically recommend people one study under someone. I know Masterclass has some great storytelling uh, classes, but yeah, or study the hero's journey. I, you don't need any of that, uh, to be honest. I mean, if you watch television uh, with a more like, if you want to create better content, you need to learn to consume content better. So it's really easy to be passive and watch TV or watch Netflix. Uh, or watch something on Amazon Prime or Hulu mm -hmm. and just kind of sit back. But if you want to really understand how co great content works, you just need to start analyzing the content that's created, right? So, you know, it, it doesn't matter what you watch. If you watch game shows and you love game shows, think about the drama that they create, you know? Uh, basically, if you want to tell a great story, you essentially need to build suspense. If you want to get people to watch an entire uh, you know, video or consume a whole long blog post or uh, write a great landing page, you've you got to sh first show the audience what they want, right? Yeah. And then you've got to threaten it. So whatever they want, uh, whether it's a great vacation, if they want a great vacation, you've got to show them a great vacation and then tell them, you know what, this vacation's really far away for you. You know, it's very expensive. It's going to be really hard to get. And if you're going to tell the story of someone who got on that vacation, yeah. you want to say, look at me, I'm on vacation, but it's been a long road to get here. Here are all the things I had to overcome to get here. And that drama builds emotional tension and you actually are inspired to act when your tension is at the highest, when you're emotionally involved in the story you're consuming and that's when you want to take action. Um, so yeah, so you know, I, I don't, I honestly don't think you need a master class. I think you need to mimic the things that you see and love and that your audience loves. So, you know, what, I don't know, what is, what is your audience love? Uh, science, um, getting better self productivity, stuff like that, yeah. like building themselves up, which leads to yeah. storytelling because I often talk about writing your own story and how it's really yeah, important yeah. to make sure that you have your backstory so that you know about it. Yeah. 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 I mean, if, if you know, if your audience loves science, start watching like the most popular science stuff online. Like the, I mean, I love Mythbusters and uh, yeah. there's actually a new version. I think it's on in Canada. I saw it recently. Uh, you know, so like if, if you just dissect how Mythbusters works, like what is the drama and the tension? It's pretty simple, right? Like here's a myth. Let's try to figure out if there's any truth behind this. Mm -hmm. That's the tension that they build. And then here's the outcome and the payoff. It is a plausible, you know, so it, like that's a great story. It's got a good beginning, a middle and an end. And it really does build the tension. You want to see the outcome, which means you consume it all. And if there was an action to take, you know, if it was the science of job hacking or, yeah. you know, web hacking, whatever it is, uh, you know, you can do the same kind of thing. So don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel. I don't think there are any new ideas ideas out there. Uh, there are idea, great ideas that you can be inspired to create from. Boom. So there's an excuse already to uh, watch more TV, movies. Yeah, exactly. Analytically. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Just the, it's homework. Just, and if somebody complains that you're watching too much stuff, just say, dude, I'm doing homework. I'm, yeah. I, I actually have a notebook and like I, I, I'm showing it to, to Austin on the video thing right here. Yeah. And I keep it with me at all times and I'm like constantly writing stuff down that I oh. learn watching or consuming other people's content not about the content itself but the structure the format of the content yeah. those are the important things and and i think if you i mean if you want some kind of really practical advice i think if you want to be successful in the online world today you, you basically have to do three things one you have to pick a niche um, i always say get rich target a niche um, 
and you need to go deep enough that that it's a valuable audience but not too deep that there's no one there and not too broad that you're trying to compete with everybody else uh, number two you need to make an appointment with your audience you need to tell people when you're gonna be releasing content about what like I have a show called unsolicited advice on LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, and I, I release that every Thursday uh, and people have come to expect it. And if I skip a week, people are messaging me going like, are you all right? Did you die? Right? Like that's, that was yeah. good. That means the content's consumable and that they like it. Uh, and the third thing is you need to, you need to have a hook. And that's a television term I learned um, when I was in the TV business. But a hook is a simple twist on a familiar theme designed to ensnare or entrap your audience. So um. you need to, you, you need to like, really find something that is familiar enough like it's not too revolutionary and new that they don't get it yeah. um and it feels like something they could fall in love with but it's got a new twist on it so if you were going to do Mythbusters for uh you know for 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 life hacking okay cool that's yeah. i can see that show and that would be appealing to me totally and with niche one of the funniest ones that i think that i see uh, day to day, sometimes walking around in Chicago, is sports clips. It's literally a sports place for a haircut. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Who was like, genius? I like sports, <laughs> I like haircuts, and everyone's like, I'm going to sports clips because they got a football. Yeah, game. right. Yeah, yeah. So, that's. I mean, look, like it's. Uh, there's a million of those. You know, I've I've bumped into. Uh, there's a a woman I know, Jenny Doan. She's she's a, you know, she's she's she started a quick quilting tutorial on YouTube <laughs> about five years ago. Uh, now she runs a hundred million dollar business from Hamilton, Missouri. And it's just for people who like to quick quilt, not even quilts. Oh, wow. I mean, some people that like to quilt also like her, but you know, that's, that's a niche. So, you know, yeah. you got to divide and subdivide your audience to find exactly who you're talking to. Uh, and you can grow down the tree, but you know, you got to start with a really loyal, passionate fan base. Totally. And so with that, because marketing uh, is so important, I did want to talk about how these concepts apply to the human itself, like to you, who you yeah, are, yeah. like marketing yourself and how that plays out in real life. Yeah, I mean, I think marketing yourself is, is very similar. Like, you know, who exactly are you marketing yourself for? Who do you want to be when you're, you know, when, when you grow up, <laughs> uh, which I still think about at age 45, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, so like I, I do a very similar exercise. Like um, I have a, I have a fill in the blank, right? Like I am the blank of blank. So for me, I say I'm the Alton Brown of the marketing world, you know? And, and for me, that paints a vision of who I kind of want to emulate. It kind of paints a picture of the kind of content I want to create. It kind of paints a mental picture for people that don't know me of who I might be like. Um, you know, and other people have said, uh, they, uh, no one's ever, people have said I look like or remind them of Alton Brown, but, uh, you know, people uh, in their comments after they've seen me speak, they'll say things like, um, you're the Malcolm Gladwell of the business world, right? Which is a huge compliment because yeah. Malcolm Gladwell wrote Tipping Point and Blink and a bunch of other great books. Uh, and so, you know, from, yeah, like that's, that's huge for me. Um, and he's got a, a master class, which I haven't taken, but I'm sure it's pretty cool. Uh, or people have told me that uh, somebody just the other day told me I was the Emerald Lagasse of marketing and business. Uh, <laughs> like the guy from Food Network yeah. that goes bam all the time. Uh, you know, so, so I think like if you kind of try to help, help look at the rest of the world and define your blank for blank, um, you know, that kind of helps you focus. And I think when you're trying to define who you are, um, and, and figure out where you want to go. It, it often, um, you feel directionless. Those things to me help shape a direction. I think the other thing is, um, maybe there's three things. So there's that. Yeah. The second is taking advantage and, 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 um, elevating the things that make you unique, which are usually the things people tell you you're not, you, sh you can't turn a career into, you know, like yep. when I was a kid, I was a class clown and I was, uh, you know, uh, disrupted the class all the time. And, you know, I always had weird questions to ask the teacher and I always thought of things differently than the class did. Um, and, you know, everybody told me I got to be quiet. I need to sit down, <laughs> like stick to the homework. Like don't ask weird questions that take us off track, like just focus. Um, and, you know, to be honest, those things that they told me I shouldn't do and that won't lead to a career and can't be a job are all the things I get paid for doing today. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm essentially a class clown that tours around the world teaching people about marketing because I think very differently than anybody else. And uh, those are my assets. So take the things that are most unique about you, oftentimes the things that people tell you 
you, you shouldn't be uh, doing and elevate those. Um, and I think the third thing is to, to not worry so much about a career path. Yeah. Um, I hate, I, I actually, I don't think career paths are relevant anymore. You know, path is like a, a prescribed journey that you have to go on a series of steps that are going to take you to being what you want to be. And, and that's just irrelevant. I, I think it's much more fulfilling to just focus on your next step. Like what knowledge are you lacking? What um, experience would you like to have? Uh, what opportunities are along your way? I call it a career quest, <laughs> yeah. but you know, a quest is a, a long, arduous search for something, and you may know kind of what that looks like, um, and you know, you, you, but you need a couple of things if you're going to be successful on a quest. You need great companions, you like, you need friends that are going to support you, and a group that understands what you're trying to do that are going to help you on that journey. Um, you know, two, I think you need to to really take your assets and exploit those, like really showcase your talent um, so that people can find new opportunities for you. And, and I think the last thing you have to do if you're going on a career quest um, is, is really focus on your passion. Like what are the things you really love? Uh, because those, those are the things that give you purpose and actually find fulfillment. And you know, my career path is a weird one. Um, okay. If you charted it out, it looks much more like a quest where I was always looking for mm -hmm. the next opportunity to, to help me take me take myself to the next level that is that awesome. was long so, no that was awesome um so do people call you the emerald of marketing because you yell bam on the stage <laughs> i don't i don't think i've ever yelled bam i think it's because of the energy and enthusiasm i bring to you know you know i'm really passionate about changing the way people think about marketing and business um and so for me i think they see it as like the Emerald Lagasse of, of business is just, man, he brings a lot of passion and energy oh. to what he's doing like Emerald Lagasse does. You know, you, you can't say Alton Brown is that passionate. I mean, he's got, he's yeah. kind of a nerd and like, you know, uh, he, you know, he's fun and he's scientific and he's a little geeky, but he doesn't have the kind of like just raw passion that Emerald Lagasse has. And I think that's what people are referring to when they say that. Awesome. And so let's, let's move a little bit into town Inc and yeah. the ability to actually uh, market a town. Because, yeah. <laughs> uh, that is something that I feel like things can get bigger and bigger, and eventually you're going to see like an ad for the United States or in like, some <laughs> country somewhere else. It's like, yeah, there we're, are we're here. Yeah. We're like, yeah. I mean, I don't know because I'm not somewhere else. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, like I just was invited to speak at an event in Chile um, in South America uh, at, at their – like country branding conference, which is all about branding Chile. Uh, so yeah, that stuff happens. <laughs> so how does number one, one begin to uh, brand a town or uh, come up with a town slogan and stuff like that? But two, what are some examples of towns that are already branded? Yeah, well, well so number one, no matter who you are or where you live or what you do, you should be marketing the place you do business just as much, if not more than the business you do. So if you have a website, you should go to your about us page right now. And if your about us page doesn't say where you do business and why you are there, you are doing yourself and your community a total disservice. And if you're, if your answer is like, well, I'm here because I grew up here or I'm here because I, you know, I, I like the weather, whatever, like those are not real reasons. Like I want you to dig deep. Because you live in a world where you can work from anywhere. You don't have to live where you live. And, and when you attach what you do to the place you do it, you can add tremendous value to the business you do. So I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the brand Shinola. Yeah, I'm um, actually from Detroit, so I know. Oh, you know Shinola, know yeah. Place. Yeah, so Shinola, Detroit. Uh, do, you, do you know how they, they came up with attaching it to Detroit? Have you heard about no. that? Uh -huh. So basically the venture capitalist, Tom Kartsotis, who's behind Shinola, um, wanted to localize the brand. And by the way, he's from Dallas. He's, he, you know, really? he has no, no affinity to, to, De to Detroit. Uh, but what he decided to do was he went across the country and did focus groups uh, with people. And he said, hey, look, here's a pen. Um, th this pen was made in China. How much would you pay for it? And people would say an average of $5, about $5. Then he would say, here's another pen that looks very similar, but this pen was made in America. How much would you pay for it? And the average was around $10. They would double it. Okay. Uh, and then the third pen he would pull out and he would start listing cities. He would say, this pen is made in San Francisco. This one's made in Seattle. This one's made in Dallas. This one's made in Miami. And, and he would see what they would say for the value of that pen. 
the city with the highest value was Detroit. Really? Three times the amount of the Chinese pen. So if you, give, if you say this pen is made in Detroit, I will pay an average of $15 for that pen versus the Chinese pen at $5. And that's when he decided, well, that's it. We're going to take this brand. We're going to call it Shinola Detroit instead of just Shinola. We're going to take over a GM building in Detroit, and we're going to now market the place we do business just as much as the business we do because it adds value to the product we create. So imagine if you sitting – you're in Michigan today, right? Yep, yep. If you're in Michigan, imagine if you could charge three times as much for whatever service you provide just because it was in Michigan. Wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah. Yeah, you would, right? And that's what I'm about to do. I'm about to be like, why don't you buy this city of Detroit? There you go. Yeah, and that's, that's what happens. Uh, if you want a good example of a great About Us page, go read the Shinala uh, About Us page. It's, it's, it's called Our yeah. Story. And it is, it is the most amazing example of a, a great About Us page that showcases exactly why there's a value to the place you do business in an online world where no one seems to care. So th the answer to your second question is I basically spent t uh, three years driving across the United States, you know, flying around, visiting um, cities and towns trying to figure out why we're some were more successful than others and it turns out that the most successfully branded places when it comes to value to the economy and the businesses and people there uh, were places that just filled in a blank like blank is the blank capital of the world so Detroit is the luxury manufacturing capital of luxury goods manufacturing capital of the world that's what Shinola says on their about us page um, and the average, if you can fill in those blanks, and it doesn't matter what the niche is, uh, you, you can fill it in for it. You could be the uh, you know, Amazon uh, paid advertising and search capital of, of the world in Detroit. Yeah. It, it, people will believe it and buy into that, that you're part of this movement. Um, Cleveland is the content marketing capital of the world. Uh, Warsaw, Indiana is the orthopedic manufacturing of the world. Warsaw, Indiana is a town of only 13,000 people and $17 billion a year pumps through that little economy. Oh my God. So the average on the city, so if you, it, what we did was we, we, we did a study with Northeastern University and we compared cities that had filled in the blanks versus cities that hadn't. The very similar ones, like same geography, same resources, same education level, same about the same population, uh, and the average between the two was three point nine. Sorry, two point nine billion dollars a year extra pumping into that economy just because they filled in the blank. Uh, I was just in Arizona last week, uh, and I, I I met some people from uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona which is the hummingbird capital <laughs> of the United States. And those, here's the thing, marketing this way is very sticky. Yeah. It, it paints a picture in your mind and it's the kind of thing you never forget, uh, you know, especially if you meet someone from that place. It, oh. it forces you to paint your own mental picture of what that might, might look like. Um, and then the second thing it does is it attracts the right kind of customers, clients, and prospects, as well as dreamers and innovators to your community. People are People believe that they will be more successful in that city than anywhere else. So if I'm in the orthopedic business, I could, I could do business in Red Bank, New Jersey, or I could probably be more successful if I moved to Warsaw, Indiana. Like if you want to be, if you, if you if, let me ask you this, Austin. Yeah. If you wanted to be in country music, where would you move? Nashville. It, bingo, right? There's no, no, you don't need stats. No one needs to tell you, hey, you should move. To, you just believe then you need to move there to be more successful. And that's the power of, of, of branding a place and marketing the place you do business more than the business you do. It's called location envy. And it's this emotional belief that you, you know you'll be successful somewhere else. Awesome. awesome. That is so cool. And uh, <laughs> so now uh, I've been hey. in Detroit. This is Yay, awesome. he's got a mug. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so I got to ask you, what is your higher leverage skill? So a higher leverage skill is something that you can extrapolate from basically any field, uh, but you yeah. learned it in one and you can now use it others. So learning to learn because now you can learn things better. Learning yeah. to breathe better lets you exercise better, meditate mm. better, do all these things better. Um, learning pattern, pattern recognition allows you right. to see patterns in places and then utilize that. Do you have anything that has really helped you, a tool, trick? tactic or skill yeah, yeah i think um it would probably be uh like if i had a superpower <laughs> yeah. it's like it's like i i uh i have this really 
uh, amazing ability, I think. I, I don't think it's amazing, but I, I, I realize it now um, because I've tried to teach it to other people. Uh, it, it's, it's this ability to, to kind of um, extrapolate a meta framework for yeah. things that I see in the world, right? And it's why I draw a lot, actually. I sketch a lot. Uh, like, not artsy stuff, but yeah. like if, if somebody tells me um, – you know, they've done X, Y, and Z, or even like, uh, like when we were talking about the towns, um, you know, I start to try to draw a framework for how it's possible this works. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I, for some reason, seem to be able to extract the kind of meta level information that allows me to first build a hypothesis on why it might work, then second, test the hypothesis, uh, and then third, refine and kind of teach it to other people to see if it's actually replicatable. So if somebody's got, you know, 10 million followers on YouTube, uh, it's easy to say, well, that's a lightning in the bottle success. Like they have something special, you know, it's easy to kind of dismiss those things. And I'm very quick to say, well, no, but maybe yeah. it's, there's a replicatable uh, process here. Let's really dissect what happened and try to see if it's possible to emulate that, you know, what we've, we've seen happen there. And that's actually what happened with Town Inc. Um, and with my first book, Brandscaping, you know, it was all based on this idea that I could um, it really understand how to build an audience better or save a town by extrapolating what might work, build a framework for it, and then share it with other people. Totally. That is awesome. You strike me as someone who, traveling around with the journal, do you write all your ideas down? Yeah, I mean, I, I write tons of stuff down. Let's see, what did I write down yesterday? Uh, so I've been working on, this is a good example, but I've been working on a, a formula for attention um, and, and earning attention. So uh, my theory is that it's, it's essentially suspense over time multiplied by the payoff. Um, and you can earn as much attention as you want as long as you're building uh, suspense over you know over a long enough period yeah. of time and there's like little elements you can break down like how do you actually build suspense well you got to create curiosity gaps and a need for closure and what's the ratio of those so you know it's kind of a meta level so I was drawing that yesterday all sorts of ideas that is awesome yeah have you uh, have you ever explored Mac labs at all Mac labs no what's that um, it's MEC labs that are located in Florida but they have a few equations uh, similar to what you're talking about where They'll teach you how to isolate variables and figure out all these different uh, cluster variables when optimizing things. When oh, cool! Um, super cool stuff, uh, and I'm pretty sure they have. You could find the equations all over. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna check it out. That's awesome. I'm just, I was actually just looking it up. That's awesome. Looks awesome. great. Yeah, no, I'll, it's I'll uh, bookmark it, and I'll, I'll look it up on Saturdays. Saturdays is my like research. Like every, I get a lot of people saying, you should check this out or you should check yeah. that out. So I usually add it to my calendar on Saturday mornings and, uh, and start checking it out. I like that. I need to do that. I have like tabs open and then I'll... Oh, well, it's the worst. I do I'll that too. Like, or my computer crashes and then my tabs won't come back and I'm like, what? I lost yeah. it. I'm yeah, like, it's really like annoying. Nine, nine people's worth of recommendations. I know. <laughs> That's so, right. Currently, is there anything that you're currently uh, questioning? So this could be life, uh, the way doorknobs work, politics, whatever <laughs> it is. It's something that common consensus is like, oh yeah, it works this way, and you're like, I just don't think it works that way. Um, I don't. I mean, I I don't. I actually spend, I think, most of my day questioning those things, like like attention. I mean, I think that yeah. I've spent a lot of time on this in the last couple of years. Um, you know, when people say your content has to be shorter, people only have an attention span yeah. of a fish you know like people don't have time to read your blog post or listen to your podcast you know my initial thought is well maybe that's true but I don't think people's attention spans are any shorter today than they were a long no. time ago if you if you're interested in something I mean I know for me right if I'm interested yeah. in something I will spend days days consuming stuff learning stuff reading writing downloading books buying books listening to podcasts I, I have an infinite attention span for the stuff I find interesting yeah. So, you know, I just don't believe that's the case. And so I've been questioning uh, and trying to find great examples of people who are able to re retain people's attention for a long time and then trying to build that meta level understanding of how it works and why it works. Yeah, with attention, it's an interesting thing because the goldfish thing I do not agree with. And I've heard multiple times that it's not that our attention spans are shorter, it's that the availability of quality is everywhere now. So you can quite literally go, 
this article is not good or you start reading and you mm. trail off because it's bad copywriting and then you're like yeah. next, next next and that's what makes sense yeah yeah i mean i think i i think that's probably part of it i actually think that the that, that content producers themselves are partly to blame um yeah. because uh you know, to, to earn someone's attention, you do, you, there are two psychological phenomena you really need to leverage. The first is that curiosity gap. You need to, because pe people have a deep desire to, to actually, if, you know, fill that gap between what they, they know or what they want to know or what they need to know. And they want to do it as fast as possible, but they always also want to do it in a way that actually gets them to the end of, like yeah, a good example of this is how to content, right? Yep. How to videos, fill a curiosity gap and you can't fast forward a how to video and expect to get the <laughs> outcome, right? Like you can't skip nine steps and be like, wow, I, got it. I figured it out. No, you have to watch the whole thing. So that does retain your attention for as long as possible. But the second thing is I think people have a deep desire and a need for closure, meaning it, it, they, they don't like ambiguity. They want an answer, right? So if you promise me in a headline, that I'm going to tell you the answer and I'm now three paragraphs in and I'm still not at the answer, I'm going to bail. Um, but that doesn't mean the content needs to be short. It needs to, it needs, the headline needs to be better. The content yep. you're creating needs to point the way and constantly close small curiosity gaps so that you get to the need for closure, but you also are moved along in the journey where you're teasing people constantly, not in a bad way, but you're inviting them to chase the answer with you. Let me, let me take you on this journey to get you where you want to go. Clickbait has, has, I think, changed our perception of what attention is. You know, like yep. when you tease me with, you know, stupid headlines uh, where I need, yeah. I need closure, right? It's like, watch what this line does when, I, when this man hugs him, right? Like, yeah. I got to know I, because I don't like ambiguity. So I click the link. And when it turns out to be stupid and I just wasted four and a half minutes, you're betraying my trust and you're ruining my attention for other people's content just as well. So I think, I think we're going to move past that, to be honest, if I had to predict. You know, I think people are smarter and smarter and, and so many brands have betrayed their trust with crappy headlines and yeah. clickbait concepts that, um, you know, we'll soon be in an era where the, the best stuff does rise to the top and you're able to uh, even consume long form. Here, here's, the, here's the bottom line. The same people that say they have no time and a short attention span will, will binge watch two seasons of yeah. Stranger <laughs> Things on a Saturday, right? Like, don't tell me you don't have any time. If it's yeah. interesting... I can exactly. earn your attention. Exactly. And so I think Marvel, going back to yeah. the beginning, is great at this because I will sit and I will watch the end credits to find the last scene every single time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that, I mean, that's perfect. You have a need for closure, right? Like you're like, I, I know there's going to be a hidden gem here. I got to see what happens. Uh, and I'm not getting up until I see it, you know? Exactly. Um, so attention is awesome. And it might be your answer to this, but what are you currently obsessed with? Oh my lord! I I feel like I'm obsessed with attention, but maybe not. Um, uh, well, I I'm I'm kind of obsessed. I, I wouldn't say I'm obsessed with consuming it, but Instagram television has intrigued okay. me. Have you checked yeah. it out? Yeah, I actually I post videos on there all the time. What do you think of it? I like it. Um, I like the vertical. It's definitely interesting. Uh, when there's search functionality and things like that better like i think they could definitely compete with youtube and do uh something like that but it is a more personal type video because it is uh vertical mm. i'm just waiting for you know snapchat i hated because you can never search for sure. <laughs> yeah for all this stuff the algorithms need to get better on uh, instagram television and the functionality needs to be better because every time i press it it automatically starts playing audio and taking over my uh, yeah. whatever I was doing on my phone. And that is annoying because yeah. I like, pause and then it clicks the next one. I'm like, damn it. Okay. Pause. I'm trying to listen to something and just upload a video. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think more fundamentally to me, the shift to vertical video is a really intriguing one, right? Like why, what can you do better in vertical video that you can't do in horizontal? And that's what I've been obsessed with. I've been, and I think you're right. I think you're onto something. Like it's a, it's a medium designed for showing one person talking to the camera, um, and I, you know, it's it makes it a very self-important medium, <laughs> yeah. uh, which which I actually have trouble with. Like I don't think I'm that important. I don't think people really want to hear what I think. Um, and you know, 
it's ironic that I get paid to tell <laughs> people what I think, but uh, you know, I think uh, on their personal time in their personal space, I have trouble with that. So I've been really challenging myself to kind of look at the medium itself yeah. and kind of extract from it because coming out of the television and film business, um, you know, I studied and I studied it when radio, when radio evolved. So essentially when the radio business all of a sudden felt threatened by television, what, what, when, and television first came out, what they actually decided to do was just point a camera at a radio show. Right. So it was the same stuff they were doing on radio. They were just pointing it. At, and it wasn't until people like Ernie Kovacs, great, great comedian that, that used television in a really smart way where people were like, wow, this medium is like has possibilities that we've never imagined. We don't have to point it at a radio show. We could tell a story and show pictures and, you know, have, build a set. And like, this is really cool. Um, and so I kind of feel like IGTV is there because, yeah. you know, with what people are doing with vertical video is basically what people did with horizontal video. They're like, well, I don't know. Like we'll just do what we used to do and yeah. see what yeah. happens. Uh, but I think there's something special there. If I could just figure out what it is, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do it. Um, so I watch a lot of IGTV and I, I would consider it being obsessive in nature, meaning that I'm obsessed with trying to find the answer to this question. I haven't seen it yet. I can tell you, there, the one thing I've seen that was really cool was it's a, a Korean pop um, music video. Uh, and it basically they use the vertical uh, platform as kind of a, as if you were on your phone. So like it would swipe up the video yeah, cool. and it was like the, like it was like in the music video, you were reading your emails and then you would open an email and she would pop out and start singing at you. And That's then really cool. she would, she would like hold her phone up to your phone and all of a sudden like, like a FaceTime call would come in. So yeah. it was, that was awesome because it felt like it was a fusing of the, the concepts and I, I was pretty impressed with that. But that's the only, the only real execution of vertical video that I thought, wow, that's creative and they're doing something new that you wouldn't have yeah. been able to actually execute in horizontal video that way. Yeah. And I think, uh, I don't know if Red Bull or GoPro has done this yet, but they could definitely portray the first person a lot better mm. because it's mm. how we actually like, yes, we have the periphery and where we look as humans and we see the outside, but most things are tuned into the front. Right. So if you could portray that, then you could probably get depth better. You could get a few things better. Oh, that's interesting. More vertical. Well, that's, that's an interesting idea. Maybe I'll try that. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Cool. But besides that, I know you're going to run. Yeah. Where can people find you? Uh, so, so you can find me on Instagram because I'm experimenting with IGTV. I'm at Drew Davis here. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Drew Davis here on there as well. Uh, my website is aka drewdavis.com. Uh, and uh, the, the, like the most important places are probably YouTube where I do a, a video series every week called The Loyalty Loop. Uh, and I do a uh, uh, unsolicited advice on LinkedIn and IGTV because I'm experimenting with it uh, every Thursday. So look awesome. me up on those platforms and uh, yeah, uh, reach out. I'd love to chat and stay in touch with your audience too, man. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, uh, Austin. It was awesome. Yeah, this has been really fun. I really appreciate you having me on and, and yeah, good luck. Thank you.